Here in the month of December, I thought on the Sunday podcast episodes, we'd try something a little bit different. It'd give me a little bit of a a break doing this as we kind of get into the holiday season, but it also gives me an opportunity to to share with you some of my my friends and guys that I've known and their preaching, their sermons uh, that they have done. And today is Drew Suttles. He writes uh, quite a few of our articles on Saturday, Friday and Saturday usually, uh, in the guest list, guest articles. So you're, ve- you're very familiar with his writing, but maybe you've never heard him preach before. And you are in for a treat. Drew does a great job preaching the Word of God. I uh, went to school with him uh, several years ago now, and just really grateful to call him a brother and a friend. And I know you're going to be blessed by this lesson that he preached now almost three years ago down at the Quitman Church of Christ in South Georgia. The title of his lesson is Eight Reasons to Remain Optimistic from Romans Chapter 8. And so I'll turn it over to Drew. This is Drew Suttles preaching nearly three years ago at the Quitman Church of Christ and doing a wonderful job from Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, we want to begin in verse 1. Why should we as Christians be optimistic? Because for the Christian there is no condemnation. Notice what the Apostle Paul does as he begins this great chapter. He is bringing his thesis to fruition. What is the thesis statement of the book of Romans? It's Romans 1.16. That salvation is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ, not in the law of Moses, not in anything that man has brought about, but in the gospel. That's God's power unto salvation. And now in this entire chapter, Paul wants to explain that thesis statement. Brother Robert Taylor Jr. in his commentary said, this is where the New Testament really begins. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Brethren, that's a victory shout. How powerful is that? There is right now no condemnation for the child of God. But I want you to notice that this is a conditional statement. In fact, there are two conditions presented. First, it is the location. There's no condemnation to to who? To those who are in Christ Jesus. Last week we studied through the book of Galatians. How does one get into Christ Jesus? Well, it's through obedience to the gospel. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. That's how one gets into Christ. So you must be in the right location. But then you must have the proper lifestyle. Who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. What does that mean? Your life is in harmony with what the Spirit has revealed through the Word of God. You walk in harmony with God's will. What is the commentary, the divine commentary on that? 1 John 1, 7 through 9. As we keep on walking in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing us. And we have that fellowship with the Father. And so right off the bat in Romans chapter 8, our first reason why we as Christians ought to be optimistic is that there is no condemnation for the child of God. Number two this morning, another reason why we as Christians ought to be optimistic is that we have freedom in Jesus Christ. Look at verse two. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Did you notice there are two laws mentioned in this passage? Look at verse three. There's another law. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh... God did by sending His own Son the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So in verse 3 we had the law of Moses. Three laws mentioned in verses 2 and 3. But only one law can give us freedom. What law is that? It's the law of Christ. It's what Jesus Christ brings about. We have freedom in Christ. Last week we mentioned Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. What does Paul say? Stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't go back to the old law. Don't go back to your former way of life. If you're in Christ you have freedom. Live that way. And be thankful for that. Free from guilt of a past life of sin. Free from doubt. Wondering whether or not we're saved. Whether or not we're really free spiritually. You shall know the truth, Jesus said. 
And the truth will make you free. John 8 and verse 32. Why should we as Christians be optimistic? Because for the child of God, there's no condemnation. And for the child of God, there is absolute freedom in Jesus Christ. Number three this morning as we continue on. Why should the child of God be optimistic? Because in Christ, we can have peace even in the midst of the storms of life. You know, as Christians, we are not immune to struggle, are we? We're not immune to the trials of life. In fact, we ought to expect it. All that strive to live godly in Christ Jesus, listen to Paul, will suffer persecution. It's going to happen. We're going to struggle. But you know what? Even in those struggles, even in those storms, we as Christians can have peace. How many in the world right now at this very moment are searching for peace and they can't find it? Maybe they look for what the world has to offer and maybe they think they have peace, but it doesn't last. It's not real. But what Jesus offers is real peace. Peace that will last. Notice verse 6 with me. Paul says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What does it mean to be carnally minded? To think about this world. All we think about is getting up and going to work. Getting our paycheck, coming back home. All we think about are the things of this life. Brethren, that can't be so. We can't think that way. We've got to think spiritually. We've got to elevate our thinking. If you've been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, not on earth. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. We can have peace in the storms of life if we are spiritually minded. If you go back to Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, you see that, uh, that Paul will explain this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, just if I'd never sinned by our faith in the gospel, our obedience to the gospel, justified by the blood of Jesus, we have peace with God through who? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul told the brethren in Philippi, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And what will happen? The peace of God, which passes understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through who? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, brethren, we're in Jesus Christ. We obeyed His gospel. And because of that, look at these blessings. No condemnation, freedom, and real peace. As we navigate through the storms of this life. Number four this morning. Another reason to remain optimistic is God's people. Is that the Spirit of God dwells in us. The Spirit of God dwells in us. Now I understand and I appreciate the fact that in the religious world. There is a lot of confusion when it comes to the Holy Spirit. How does He operate? Does He do so miraculously? Does He do so directly? Does He speak to me in the middle of the night and wake me up? Does He tell me to get this parking spot? There's a lot of confusion. I don't say that to be ugly. But there's a lot of confusion. You know why? Folks have not opened up their Bible to see what the Bible actually says about the Holy Spirit. What would we know about the Holy Spirit without the Bible? Could you tell me? Everything that we know about Him, we know because it's been revealed to us. So what does the Bible say regarding the Spirit? Does He dwell in the Christian? Look at this text with me here in Romans 8, verses 9 through 11. And notice three times in this text, Paul is going to mention that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Who's Paul writing to? He's writing to Christians. You Christians are not in the flesh, you're in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. He hasn't obeyed his gospel, he hasn't submitted to him, he doesn't belong to him. He doesn't hear his voice and follow him, John 10, 27. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. You died to sin. You were buried with Christ. You rose to walk in newness of life. Romans 6, verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Again, three times. And so the question is not, does the Spirit of God dwell in the Christian? He does. The question is how. How does He do that? And the Bible teaches... The Spirit of God dwells in the Christian through the avenue or the mode or the medium that is the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean, Paul? Look at Colossians 3.16. Let the Word of Christ dwell 
in you richly. That's how the Spirit of God dwells within the Christian. Through the Word of God. Through a reading, studying, meditation, and application of the Word of God. That's how the Spirit dwells within the Christian. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians 6, 17. And so now that we know that He does dwell and we know how He dwells, what do we learn from this great text that the Holy Spirit does for us? Two things specifically from this text. Number one, He bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Verse 16. Now I want you to notice something. If you like to highlight in your Bible, underline, circle like I do, highlight or circle or underline the word with. So many in the religious world will look at this passage and take the word with out and put in the word to. That changes everything, doesn't it? That brings about this direct operation idea. That you don't have to do anything. The Spirit will directly act on you and then everything. That's not what the Bible teaches. Here the Bible says the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. What does that mean? The Spirit is, is pleading on our behalf that we have obeyed what He has revealed. I've obeyed the gospel. The Spirit sees that and bears witness of that fact. But here's what's beautiful about it. The Holy Spirit's on our side. He's on our side. He's in our corner. Here's another thing that He does. He helps us in prayer. Verses 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. We do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, with sighs that baffle words. There are times when we go to God in prayer, we don't know what to say. Have you ever done that? Have you ever knelt by your bed and prayed and you just cried? You couldn't get a word out? Guess what? God heard it. The Spirit makes intercession for us. He's pleading on our behalf. The end of verse 27, He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. We're going to notice later that Jesus Christ also makes intercession for us at the right hand of God. Brethren, that ought to keep us optimistic that the Spirit of God dwells within us that He bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and that He helps us in the avenue of prayer. Number six this morning, as we can, or number five rather, as we continue on, really building off of that point, we ought to be optimistic because we are God's children. Let's look at verses 14 through 17 as we back up in the text. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You do not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. No. You receive the spirit of bondage, uh, not the spirit of bondage, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You remember last week in Galatians chapter 4, Paul used the exact same statement. We cry out, Abba, Father, because we have that relationship. Notice that we have been adopted into the family of God. How? Through our obedience to the gospel. We are the children of God. Verse 17, if we're children, then we're heirs. We're heirs of God. Does it get any better than that? Yes, it does. We're joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with Him, that we also may be glorified together. We are God's children. Through our obedience to the gospel, we were adopted into the family of Almighty God. Beloved, what manner of love has the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God? 1 John 3 and verse 1. We obeyed the same gospel. We were added to the same body, that is the church that belongs to Jesus Christ. And we embraced the same promises from Almighty God. We are His children. In this context, in the first century, if you wanted to adopt a child, you know what you had to do? The parents that wanted to adopt the child, they would have to go to that household, that, that home, and they would offer the family money. And they would literally purchase that child, take the child back with them, and the adoption process would be complete. Much different than what we see today. But think about that spiritually. We were enemies of God, Romans 5. No hope without God in this present world, Ephesians 2. And Jesus paid the price for you and for me in full that we could be adopted to the family of God. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Ephesians 1, 7. Acts 20 and verse 28. That ought to keep us optimistic. Number six. Why should we as Christians be optimistic? Why should we have confidence and hope about the future? 
Because we have the real hope of eternal glory. We have the desire and expectation to be with God forever. Look at verse 18. And consider who's making this statement. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Do you think the Apostle Paul knew what it was like to suffer? Read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 this afternoon. A man who was stoned, a man who was beaten, a man who was left for dead, a man who was shipwrecked, a man who had nowhere to sleep, nothing to eat, in prison. And what does he say? These difficult times that we're going through right now, it's not even worth comparing to the glory that shall be revealed in us. This morning you may be hurting. You may be suffering. You may be struggling with something. But listen, you can get through it because we have the real hope that one day we're going to be with God in heaven forever. That ought to keep us going. That ought to keep us optimistic. Look at verse 24. Paul says, For we were saved in this hope. Hope. Hope that is seen is not hope. We haven't seen it yet, but we believe it. We believe we're going there. We have that hope. It keeps us going. We eagerly wait for it with perseverance. We keep getting through these difficult days because we know what lies ahead when this life comes to an end. We have the real hope of everlasting life because God who cannot lie has promised us eternal life. Titus 1 1 and 2, we can know that we have eternal life in Jesus. 1 John 5, 13. And Jesus himself said, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be also. And how do I know the way? Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. We have access to the Father through Christ. And we have the real hope of going to heaven. Brethren, that ought to keep us optimistic. And keep us moving forward, even when this world is crumbling around us. Number seven. And I wish Brother Andy was here. This is one of his favorite verses. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. What does that mean? That means that whatever circumstance you find yourself in, Whatever situation you're in right now in your life, God is going to work it out for your ultimate good and His ultimate glory. That's Romans 8, 28. You may not see that right now. You may be thinking about your life and say, how am I ever going to get through this? How can this possibly be something positive? Our God's working for us. He can turn something negative into something positive. He can flip the script, brethren. Our God is for us. Our God loves us. And our God is able to work things out for our good. Now it is important to notice this. Who are those who love God? Those who just say it? No, those who obey what God has said. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5, 3. If we love God, we'll obey Him. If we obey Him, that shows that we love Him. God loves us. He sent His Son to die for us. He's proven that. Look at what He's done for us. How can we not love Him back? We love Him because He first loved us. 1 John chapter 4. All things work together for good for those who love God. I want you to notice in verse 30. This came about in my study and I'm so thankful that I, that I found this. I've never looked at it before this way. But now I'll never look at it. Uh, I'll never look at it the same. It's just amazing how this comes out. Notice there are four words that He brings out. This connects us back to verse 28. Whom He predestined, these He also called. Whom He called, these He also justified. And whom He justified, these He also glorified. Let's work backwards in that text. Who are those who will ultimately be glorified? Those who have been justified. Justified by the blood of Jesus. Obedience to His gospel. Romans 5, Romans 6. Who are those who will be justified? Those who are called. How are we called? Called by the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2.14 who are those who were called? Those who were foreordained. God already had it in His mind and His eternal purpose that those who submit to the gospel of His dear Son would obtain salvation and have the hope of being with Him forever. All things work together for good to those who love God. Look at all that God, the Godhead, has done for us. That ought to keep us optimistic. Brethren, we've looked at a lot of passages today. We've walked through this great chapter 
And it brings us to the eighth and final point this morning. Why we as Christians ought to be optimistic no matter what is going on in the world around us. And it's this. Nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want you to notice in this great text that as Paul brings this to a powerful conclusion, there are three questions here that the devil cannot answer. Number one, what then shall we say to these things? What, what does all this mean? Let, let's bring it home. Let's bring it all together. What does it mean? What shall we say about it? If God is for us, who can be against us? Can Satan answer that question? Absolutely not. We need to remember that one plus God equals the majority. Because God's already the majority by Himself. When God is on our side, we're the majority. And we'll be victorious. Who can be against us? Nobody. Nothing. He who did not spare His own Son but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Has God not proven that He's on your side? Has He not proven that He loves you? Look at what He did with the Son. Here's the next question he can't answer. Verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who shall bring a charge against us? You know, when I was studying this, I thought about Job. Job was someone that, of course, Satan brought an accusation about. You remember that in Job chapters 1 and 2. But you know something that Job did not have that we have? We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. We have a lawyer in heaven pleading our case. And that's Jesus. We have Him there for us. So if anybody tries to bring a charge against us, we can say, go talk to my lawyer. Go talk to Jesus. The one who died for me. The one who purchased my salvation with His own blood. Nobody can bring anything against us. Who is He condemns? It's Christ who died. He's the one who's risen. He's the one who's at the right hand of God. He makes intercession for us. He pleads on our behalf. Here's the final question that Satan cannot answer. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Is there anything at all that can separate us from the love of Christ? Let's look at this list. What about tribulation? No. No. What about distress? No. Persecution? No. Famine? Nakedness? Danger? The sword? Paul says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors. That phrase, more than conquerors, is one word in the Greek. You know what it is? Super victors. We are super victors through Christ. The ultimate victory through Him. Who loved us. Paul will now, as he brings this to a close, and as we bring our study to a close, Paul is now going to share with us everything that man fears. For I am persuaded, I'm convinced, I'm convicted, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Brethren, that's a victory shout. We have the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. And nothing can change it. It doesn't matter who's in office. It doesn't matter what comes from Washington. It doesn't matter what goes on in our world. We as Christians have the hope of eternal life before us, all because of Jesus Christ. And that ought to keep us optimistic. This morning, if you're not a Christian, you're missing out. You're missing out on all of these wonderful blessings that we've discussed today from Romans chapter 8. No condemnation. Freedom in Christ. A life filled with hope. Peace in the storms of life. If you're outside of Christ, you don't have those things. But here's the good news. You can obey the gospel today and have everything that comes with it. Because all spiritual blessings are in Christ. Ephesians 1.3 You may be sitting there this morning and you say, Well, I'm not a Christian. Or I don't really know if I'm saved or not. Here's what the Bible says. What must I do to be saved? It's the greatest question a man or woman can ever ask. And the Bible gives the greatest and the only true answer to that question. What must I do? First, you must hear the truth. Hear the gospel. 
Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. You must believe what you hear. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that He came to this world, that He lived a perfect life, that He died a horrible death, that He rose from the dead the third day, that He's at the right hand of God right now. Do you believe that? If so, are you willing to repent of a life of sin? Repentance is when you realize, I've been doing the wrong thing. I've got to stop doing what's wrong. I've got to start doing what's right. God commands all men everywhere to do it. Acts 17, 30. If you're willing to repent, then are you willing to confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord? Just like the eunuch did, Acts 8, 37. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10, 9 to 10. If you'll make that great confession, you can be baptized into Christ for the remission, for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2, 38. Have His blood applied to your soul and your sins washed away. Acts 22, 16. And we have the promise in the Word of God that when we come out of that watery grave, if we'll live a faithful life and we'll be faithful even in the face of death, we'll receive a crown of life, Revelation 2.10. And everything we've discussed this morning can be yours. You can leave this place this morning knowing that you are a child of God. And nobody can ever take that away from you. It may be the case this morning that you are a Christian. You have obeyed this gospel. But you haven't been optimistic. You've allowed the media... You've allowed the negativity of the world to consume your mind. And maybe you're just in a bad place and you need prayers. Guess what? That's why we're here. We love you. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. We want to help you get through this time because we're family. We're Christians and that's what we do for each other. 